thank you for joining me for another episode. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. On this episode, we are going to visit with Gordon Hayward, who is a garden designer, author of numerous gardening books, and who has lectured on gardening nationally. Over the years, I have gotten to know Gordon as a gardener, and when visiting with him in his garden, one quickly sees a man who is very passionate and deeply connected with the land. Recently, I sat down with Gordon at his Southern Vermont home to talk about gardening and his relationship with nature. I don't think I have ever met anyone who has a deeper experience of place than Gordon with his garden. Here then is our conversation. Well, my wife Mary and I bought this place and moved in in December of 1983 in a quiet snowstorm. And that day the well had been dug, so we had running water in what was in fact a derelict 200-year-old farmhouse here in Vermont. So it wasn't livable? Well, it was. We camped out for the first several months. We had a five-year-old, our five-year-old son with us at the time. We managed to get plastic covers over the windows, which stopped the breezes, or the winds, I should say. There was no insulation except corn cobs in the walls to a broken down mobile home heater in the cellar that uh, pretty much blew up every time I lit it. So we, we had to get a new heating system. So did you know that this was the place? Oh, when absolutely. I mean, this was it. Yeah, we wanted to create our home here. The garden certainly was in our, in our thinking, but what we started with is the home, is the house. And the following spring, we began the, the restoration, which we pretty much did ourselves. We hired uh, a couple people, but really it was done, done by our own sweat of the brow. I'd like to add oh, one sure. other thing, yeah. in that this is a house built by the Ranny family in the late 1700s. They were um, an important family in the little village of Westminster West. And Philip Ranny, whose eighth generation lives just up the road, and we see him go by pretty much every day. He's a dairyman working at the Putney School. What made this house so special? Oh, it was the real McCoy. It, was, it had a history. It had a 200-plus year history, which is the kind of house that I grew up on in Connecticut. My grandfather bought a house built in 17... 74 uh, in New Hartford, Connecticut, and restored that. Mary grew up in a farmhouse in the Cotswold Hills of England that probably was built in the 16 or 1700s. Both of us grew up on farms, and so this, having been a farm for over 200 years when we bought it, had all of the marks of our past as children of farmers. There were three different sources, I think, of influence on me. One was the fact that my father was a, a fruit farmer. In 1929, his, his father bought this 200-plus-year-old house, and there were already perhaps 20 acres of land cleared, and apple, peach, and pear trees were growing to some degree on this land around a 200-year-old barn. So I grew up in the late 40s and 50s and early 60s on the orchard that my father had been building since 1931 or 1932. Uh, so that was the major influence of beautiful fruiting trees in beautiful straight lines parallel to 200-year-old stone walls. The second influence was the woodland around us. The 
orchards bordered on two sides, bordered a 5,000 acres of water district land that provided some of the water for the city of Hartford. So my brother John and I and my brother Peter later on spent a great deal of time in the woods, walking in the woods and exploring the cranberry bog down at the bottom of the woodland hill where we lived. And then the third was Bill Andrus, who was a hermit who lived up in the woods. And he had moved a small utility barn, maybe 18 by 25, 24, uh, back into the back 40 uh, acres of a big property that he owned. And he became a hermit. My brother John and I would walk up to see him through about a mile of woods four or five, six times a year as boys. And he would take us and show us how he was clearing the land with a scythe, which he sharpened with a ball-peen hammer, and how he grew his own fruits and vegetables. And he'd take us into the woods and show us about the difference between a crow's nest and a squirrel's nest, that sort of thing. So it was the orchard, the tended orchard, the wild woods, and then a hermit in the midst of this, all of which were teaching me about the natural world. Was your connection to a garden or the garden already established before you moved here? No, we, we moved here in 83, as I said, and we had been living in England in the late 70s, 79 and 80. And I had had a job restoring a neglected garden around a manor house in a village called Broadwell. It was right near Chipping Camden in Gloucestershire. What that meant is that I was pretty much cleaning up the place. It was not a design job by any means. The untidiness of the place came from the fact that an 82-year-old woman who had been working with the same gardener for 48 years, had a few years before I got there decided she could no longer trust him. And so he was only allowed to work within the triangular space outside her kitchen window where she would sit all day long making sure that he was working. And he's not a whole lot younger than she was. But anyway, a young couple bought it. They hired me for one pound an hour to start cleaning up the place. But what I didn't know is how to design. And so England and its gardens was really my teacher. So when you purchased the property, did you know eventually you were going to put a garden here? Oh, absolutely. The garden is approximately 180 feet wide and about 400 feet long. It's an acre and a half. And the house is set at the northern quadrant uh, facing south as all the old homes built in New England were. The main rooms were facing south for the sunlight. And it's basically flat. There's a little bit of roll to the land uh, toward the east, but it's basically a flat piece of ground which had been farmed for 200 years. The soil we knew, having dug into it before we bought the place, was 12 inches of topsoil sitting on top of hardpan, which was ground rock from the glaciers. So it was a slowly draining but very fertile place and had still many of the marks of the old farm that was here. The barn foundations where the silo was where the calf pen was and where the milking parlor was. In fact, the floor of the milking parlor was still in intact. There was an old uh, shed that had been brought up in the 1850s, a small uh, sort of tobacco drying shed that we use and have used for a garden tools and equipment shed since we got here. There were also three junk cars, one of which was a Volkswagen bus, Another car had been here so long, a maple tree was growing up to the middle of it. So there were remnants of the previous owner's rather abject life here. Perhaps the most startling was taking my rototiller to clear what I was told had been a vegetable garden. And I started up my rototiller, whereupon I discovered that a 50 by 50 
foot area had been mulched by the previous owner with 12 by 18 foot nylon rugs, which he had then left in place and grass was growing over it. And so back to square one as I spent a week getting these nylon rug grids out so that we could begin a garden. But the one plant that was in the garden that had a lasting impact on our garden making was due south of the front door. That is about 280 feet south of the front door was a hundred year old apple tree. Absolutely the spitting image of the apple trees that I had grown up pruning. And these were the old fashioned big 25, 28 foot high and wide apple trees of the old way of, of growing an orchard. These were not the small semi-dwarf trees grown on dwarfing rootstock. This was, this, this was a serious hundred year old, absolutely neglected apple tree. And it took me almost 20 years to get it back to where it, its shape was appropriate for uh, the umbrella shape of an apple tree. But that has become the signature tree of this, of this garden. We've well, been here for 35 years. Yeah. So you obviously know every inch of this land. Mm -hmm. Kind of describe how, how that feels. Well, it's it, the, the, the property and the garden that Mary and I have been developing in unison uh, and in balance for 35 years uh, provides us with very deep sustenance. That is that, and I don't mean that we're growing food here while we are in a very modest way. It is, it's an emotional and spiritual sustenance. That is, it, it is our core, it's our center. It's what Mary and I have built together. And so that shared relationship between uh, a man and a woman in a marriage uh, working so single-mindedly year in and year out with such deep satisfaction and pleasure is the source of sustenance in our uh, relationship. And our son, Nate, who grew up here, is gardening now uh, in a very similar way. So that carries on. So how might you describe that this long-term relationship with your garden, how it's changed you over the years? Well, I, th I taught high school English in Litchfield, Connecticut, in the Berkshires, in Brattleboro, Vermont, for 15 years. And every spring, I would look out the window in a rather longing way from my classroom and say, oh, I, I need to be out there where I was as a boy, as a... Uh, as the son of a farmer, and Mary uh, was teaching in the two-room schoolhouse here in our village, she, of course, felt the same thing. That is, that this draw, that this land, which has a history uh, and which would enable us to, to root in place almost by creating a garden, was a great source of, of solace and pleasure and satisfaction. And we knew that once we got started, that our inner lives would be multiplied many times over because we were able with this place to begin expressing how it feels to dig in the earth, how it feels to make a place, to be in the right place. What we found when we began making the garden is that we were not only creating something deeply satisfying to both of us, but we were looking out at, uh, it, it, why it wasn't our land, we were looking out at probably 150 or 200 acres of meadow, of open land, which the Rannies had cleared while the American and French revolutions were going on. So this was a deeply settled place. Set by settled, I mean, 
cleared of the, the, the native trees, farmed and looked after by one family for practically 200 years before we arrived. We we're the first people out of the family to own this house. The work and the labor and the equanimity and the heartbreak and the everything of the family that experienced all that a farmer experiences was all embodied in this place, in this land, in this house. But we had known about that from growing up on two different farms. But having not been trained by somebody else, all of my design work was coming out of my past on the farm, my past in England, and then, and more probably more palpably than anything, uh, the past that Mary and I shared for 35 years making this garden. So what I was doing was learning by doing, not learning by sitting in a classroom. And I think that's made all the difference. I was able to design, but also to write and also to lecture. And so from the mid 80s until the early 2000s, which was a remarkable heyday in American gardening, I was right there as a lecturer, as the author of 11 books on garden design, and with Mary, the creator of this garden, which is now registered with the Smithsonian Archives of American Gardens. What do you think and what do you hope will happen to your garden once you've left it? The sense of place that Mary and I have shared at this place uh, is coming out of such a particular uh, sensibility that each of us have uh, and that we have combined to create a garden that takes 60, 70 hours a week to maintain the way we want it. Nobody is as nuts as we are. It's pretty clear, I think, from what we've heard from the, the Garden Conservancy and from various other people who've tried to save their gardens, that if you have a $5 million endowment, you just might be able to keep your garden up. This is so distinctly our garden, and it's just going to be a gradual letting go at some point. And you're comfortable with that. But it's okay, because it has given us such sustenance. You know, I think if anything is going to happen, the trees and the major shrubs will probably last. It's the perennials, it's the gardens that are dominated by perennials that would probably go back into lawn first. And we may even find that we have to start that process. Well, we're both in our mid-70s, and we've got a few more good years. We may have to create less of a maintenance demand on ourselves. I have this feeling that people who have a strong connection with nature deal with aging better than people who don't. Do you have a sense of that as you're growing older? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I absolutely could not agree more. Um, one, just on one very physical level, the work that we put into the garden every day, seven days a week, and by choice, I hasten to add, keeps us healthier. You know, you hear this mantra, keep moving. And we do, whether we want to or not. I might cite the last six weeks where I was raking leaves and looking to store all the leaves from this acre and a half and hundreds of mature trees all around our place has kept me moving, I can assure you. But Mary is bending over and maintaining the, the, the surface of the garden. And being 6'5", I don't bend over quite the way I used to, but still I'm out there working. So on a very physical level, I think it's, it's absolutely irrefutable that the work has kept us younger.
But then there's the other part about the sense of place, the equanimity that comes from that sense of place. And I should add the sense of community that has come and, uh, or is rather gathered around this garden over the years. Nonprofit performances and no end of events in the garden to support various cultural organizations in southeastern Vermont has given us great sustenance over the years. But then there's that sort of more intangible thing about our relationship to the natural world that we live on and with, the changing of the seasons and looking forward to spring and then the summer is here and the garden's in full bloom and we can hardly believe that we've done this and then the fall everything starts to settle in and the winter becomes the quiet time of a whole new level of sustenance. So there's another part of it consequently that is I think a life in balance. That is, that there's the outer life, the physical life, and then the inner life, the intellectual life of all of that just keeps us so engaged that uh, I think that leads to a richer life and to a life that sustains our minds and our bodies. Maybe try to explain what or what the importance of a an experience of place is, even if it's not particularly a garden. I think the relationship that we have to nature on whatever level is a centering. It's a way of touching the earth. It's a way of being in relation to the earth. And it's coming in touch with these timeless rhythms of nature that if we give nature the time to enter us and become part of us, that we gain a very deep sense of centeredness and the calmness and a sort of introspection one of the things that I promised myself years ago is that every evening, or at least at some point during the day, I go into the garden and sit and reflect on, or just look at the garden or admire it or whatever words you want to use, but just be in the garden. Avoid the list-making guilt-producing, I should be doing this, or I should have done that. And by giving myself permission to simply be in the garden for a half an hour, 45 minutes every evening, has been a source of great pleasure to me. And I think in a way I settled back into myself for that time. And all kinds of things start to happen that you don't plan or you don't, you don't uh, work at. You just are in the garden. At least I know in my garden, and, I, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's not always just your efforts that make that garden so beautiful. Like when you're sitting there sometimes by yourself, I know I will see something that I had no control over. Right that nature did it all by itself. Yeah. And it just strikes me with awe. Talk a little bit about that in your garden, about how that's, well, this, part, of, that's part of that experience. Yeah, this brings up a really important point, is that we are gardening with nature. We are cooperating. We are in concert with nature, in collaboration with nature. So, for example... Garden valerian, which is a plant that blooms in mid-June in our garden, ha has the capacity to self-seed everywhere. And Mary and I decided years ago that we would let it 
do its thing in one area of the garden. We call it the brick walk. And we let the garden valerian pretty much go in that area of the garden. So for about two weeks in June, that garden is absolutely magical, just magic. And we planted maybe 25 years ago, five garden valerian in there. So we then we just got out of the way. The last thing I would say is that the sense of place is, I think, what's largely missing in many, many, many people's lives. A sense of place, to my mind, is the source of equanimity in people and that finding one's center. And that has to be sort of reinvented in a lot of ways when you are living in an urban place. But if you are living anywhere, uh, you have the potential to create that sense of place. And that means calming down, slowing down, getting out into that place, coming to understand it, coming to understand its trees and its soil, how it really does sustain you. It's not about ownership. It's about a source of sustenance that goes beyond I hope you enjoyed my visit with Gordon Hayward and that you find your own experience of place. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. You can subscribe to Nature Revisited on your favorite podcast server. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, or on our website, nordenproductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, productions.com. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments, please send them to us through our website contact page, and we will share them on our Instagram page. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime... Remember, we are nature.